Okay, so are there any questions before we start today? Last lecture, we're going to be going over some stuff that you can use on your essay questions for today, or today for the midterm, which is on Monday, 9 to 11. I think I got the date wrong on the preview sheet. Uh -oh. I did? <laughs> okay, so we were talking about the master control gland in your body. And you note that it is located up near the brain. And actually, um, it is connected to the hypothalamus. So if I were to label the hypothalamus in this diagram, it would be right here. So this is my hypothalamus. So that means under the thalamus. We also have a connection between the pituitary gland and the um, hypothalamus, which is called the infundibulum. So this connection right here is my infundibulum. So you might remember that from your um, dissection of the sheep's heart, not the sheep's heart, excuse me, of the sheep's brain. And you might remember it um, from your list of terms for the first lab practical. So is this the anterior or posterior pituitary? Anterior means what? In front, right? So it's not superior or inferior. So it's in front. So is this in front? No. Okay. So this is my posterior pituitary. Now you'll notice that there are actually nerve cell bodies up in the hypothalamus that um, extend down to the posterior pituitary. And um, those neurons actually produce the two posterior pituitary hormones. And then they secrete them into where they're stored in the posterior pituitary and then released into the blood. So the posterior pituitary is sometimes referred to, and you need to know this word, it's called the neurohypothesis. So that's an H, that's an H right there, the neurohypothesis. So remember that another word for pituitary is hypothesis because it sits underneath the hypothalamus. So this is the nervous system, the, and they actually have a term for this. So a bundle of agri or a bundle of axons in the central nervous system are called what? What is a bundle of axons in the central nervous system, not the peripheral nervous system, is called what? Hmm? <laughs> it is called a tract, right? And so this tract extends down, and it is referred to as the, um, I have to look at my notes because I want to make sure I get the terms in the correct order. So it's the hypothalmic hypophyseal tract. So this is my hypothalmic hypophyseal Tract. So remember that a tract is a bundle of um, myelinated axons in the central nervous system. In the peripheral nervous system, it's called a nerve. But this is a tract. And so that's what that part is. And it shows the lines. And those lines are the axons that extend down. So what were the two posterior pituitary hormones that we already talked about? One is called the cuddle hormone. And it is oxytocin, right? That is believed to be really important in making connections between people, also between parent and offspring. So, you know, touching your offspring and massaging them, for example, is really important. They've actually looked at in rats, if the mothers do not 
um, interact with their offspring, like lick them, then they actually grow up to be much, much more anxious rats as adults. And so oxytocin is really important in the mother offspring, parent offspring, father offspring um, bond, that touching. This is the touch hormone. We also talked about the antidiuretic hormone. So if you think about what a diuretic is, a diuretic allows you to get rid of excess water. And one way that you do that is through urination. So actually coffee and alcohol are also diuretics and that's why they make you have to urinate more. And they can actually lead to dehydration because they kind of override and they actually make you get rid of too much water, okay? So this is the retention of water. So this antidiuretic hormone or ADH is released by the posterior pituitary, but the target cells are in the kidney. So ADH specifically targets the kidney. Now it is a protein-based water-soluble hormone. So the target cells have to have specific receptors for the antidiuretic hormone. So it doesn't influence all of your body cells, just those ones that are in the kidney mainly. That's the main function of it, okay? So this causes retention of water. Do I have to be on the essay, Christian? No. But there is an example of a, um, a, a homeostatic imbalance that is related to the antidiuretic hormone. And this is a form of diabetes, which doesn't have to do with sugar at all. So this is called diabetes insipidus. So it's not diabetes mellitus. So the diabetes that they always talk about are, is the diabetes mellitus. And one of the characteristics of diabetes is that you're really thirsty and you pee a lot, right? And so the diabetes insipidus means that you are in, it, there's not sufficient amount of, a, of ADH. So we'll put insufficient, insufficient ADH. And it causes excessive urination. And so that is just a different type of diabetes that kind of gives the same symptom, but it's not caused from insulin or excessive amounts of sugar or the inability to regulate your blood glucose levels. Okay, so let's look at the next picture. And this is obviously if it's not the posterior pituitary and it is in the front, this is the anterior pituitary. We'll put anterior. So this is on the back side. You notice that it is larger and it does um, produce its own hormones. And so it's actually, and it has glandular material in it. So it has glandular tissue. It is, produces its own hormones, doesn't just store them. It's called not the neurohypothesis, but the adenohypothesis. And you'll notice that it is not connected via a tract, but rather it is connected via a circulatory system to the hypothalamus. And so this is um, what is referred to as the hypothalamus um, portal system. The, and why can't I remember, sorry, exactly the order in which they're referred to. It's the hypophyseal portal system. So this circulatory system is the hypophyseal portal system. So this is, this would be a blood vessels. So this is circulation. Is it the same 
Yes. So that whole thing is the is the circulatory system. So you'll notice that um, blood comes in and then it goes near the neurons that are in the hypothalamus. And this is because the hypothalamus produces tropic hormones that then influence the secretion of hormones that are secreted by the um, anterior pituitary system. So I'm going to put here that the hypothalamus is producing tropic hormones that are picked up by the circulation. And it doesn't go back to the heart, um, but it goes right to, to the anterior pituitary system, which is why it's called a portal system, because it's going from one place to another. So it produces tropic hormones that travel to the anterior pituitary. So I'll just abbreviate that. Antuitary pituitary. Anterior pituitary. So those sometimes are referred to as, uh, like I think I mentioned, um, the gonadotropic releasing hormones. So they can be releasing or they could be inhibitory. So releasing would cause the anterior pituitary to release it. Inhibitory causes it not to release it. So this is a mechanism for maintaining the proper balance of hormones in the um, body. So if we look at some examples of this, there's actually six hormones. The first hormone is what is called the growth <coughs> hormone. And I'll put that these are all protein based because it's important to realize that the growth hormone, which we're gonna talk about in detail in a minute, is not a steroid. So growth hormone is not a steroid, okay? It also produces thyroid stimulating hormone. Oops, stimulating hormone. So this is called TSH. So we're going to talk about the thyroid as well and its regulation of metabolism in all the bodies of body of the cells. And then we have what is called prolactin. So like the name suggests, this is what causes lactation. So this actually um, um, is uh, what causes the breast glandular tissue to develop and the glands to start to secrete milk. So this is involved in milk secretion and we're not gonna talk about prolactin in detail. We also have the adenocortico, this is a big one, tropic hormone, cortico, cortico, I forgot that word there, tropic hormone, oh, stimulating hormone, okay, so this is abbreviated as A-C-T-H. So adenocortico, oh, oh sorry, adreno, sorry. This is the last day, isn't it? Adreno. So this is adreno, put an R in there. So that will make a lot more sense because this is what um, stimulates the adrenal glands. So we're gonna talk about these. We're gonna talk about the adrenal gland in detail and talk about the hormones that the adrenal gland produces. It also produces follicle-stimulating hormone. And luteinizing hormone. And we're not gonna talk about these in detail. Um, we'll talk about them when we get to reproduction in the third quarter. So these are um, target cells are in the gonads. 
So our ovaries and testes, which are our gonads, also produce hormones. And they are stimulated by hormones that are produced by the anterior pituitary. So they're produced, they're secreted, and then they go out into the circulation, but the only target is in the ovaries and the testes. Okay, so those are the six hormones that you need to be aware of that are um, produced and are called anterior pituitary hormones. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the um, growth hormone in detail. So I'm gonna put that this is not a steroid, but is an anabolic hormone. So when you, when you talk about anabolic hormones, what do you generally think of? Uh, Sorry. <laughs> yeah, big muscles, right? So this is what causes muscle tissue to grow. And so this causes cells to increase in size and undergo mitosis. So it increases the size of the cells, but also causes them to divide, so you get more cells. So this is actually, um, uh, they, there's targets on almost all of your body cells. So your body cells kind of all respond to growth hormone, but primarily we know their effects um, on the skeletal muscle. So we'll put primary targets is in the skeletal muscle where it can increase muscle mass and in bone growth. So growth hormone um, has a daily cycle. So it is actually at its highly highest in the um, uh, cycle in, at night. So at highest at night. Is that why kids get um, growing pains? Yes. Yep. So when kids are asleep and they, my legs used to just ache so bad. I would cry. I would get crying at night because my joints would hurt so bad. And that's because um, that growth hormone is, is really high, at least at night. And this is actually this uh, daily cycle is controlled by the hypothalamus because the hypothalamus produces a growth hormone stimulating or releasing hormone and a growth hormone inhibiting hormone. And so the overall cycle is actually regulated by tropic hormones that are secreted by the hypothalamus. So we can talk about under secretion. Sorry, my writing is terrible today. Under secretion. And in growing adults, this, sorry, in growing children, so in children, children actually have more growth hormone and, and young adults that are still growing have about twice as much growth hormone as adults. So in children, this under secretion leads to short stature, for example. And sometimes the, this can be referred to as pituitary dwarfism. And this can also be due to the fact that your, your, the cells are not responding to the growth hormone that is already being produced. So there actually has been um, some concern um, about the use of growth hormone to increase the size of children. So particularly in countries where um, height is important, say for example, for males, but maybe also for females. So if you're a taller individual, you're more likely to get a high paying job and, and than a short individual. So maybe in um, some of the um, Asian countries, for example, there's been the use of growth hormone to increase the stature of uh, people. Um, so technically that is, I, is not um, promoted here. Um, growth hormone is actually illegal to use as a non-prescription drug. However, athletes also sometimes use it in order to um, illegally um, gain a, a, an advantage to, to, the, to, to competition.
Okay. So in adults, the under secretion is, seems to be linked to osteoporosis. So osteoporosis is where you get the weakening of the bones. And so the doesn't, um, one of the things that growth hormone um, causes is cells to take in calcium and the deposition of calcium in the bones. And so there actually has been um, recently some uh, promotion of using growth hormone to extend your life to make, um, it's kind of as an anti-aging drug, but they don't, aren't using that commonly currently. So maybe it's a wonder, you know, anti-aging, because in young adults, it's much higher than it is in as you age. Don't they have a clinical I don't know. I haven't seen any news about that. Possibly. My dad was before he died. Oh, cool. I don't know the results of the Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay, so we can also talk about over-secretion. And one of the things in children, if it happens in children, then you can get gigantism, right? So these are the very big people. Um, and probably in earlier times, these were the people that were um, in sideshows in circuses. And so I have a picture from your book that shows, I think this is from your book, that shows gigantism, right? So this would be a, the woman is a normally sized person, and then that would be the person that had an excessive amount of growth hormone that could be due to a tumor in the pituitary glands that might produce too much growth hormone. And then you have the person, I, I believe in this diagram, does it say is the, is the short person one that doesn't have enough growth hormone? Yeah. Yeah, he said the pituitary dwarfism. So in adults, if you have hypersecretion in adults, um, this can cause a syndrome which is called acromegalia, or megaly, acromegaly, and that's an E. And this actually causes um, jaw, fingers, and toes to become larger. So most of your bones have stopped growing. So if for some reason you get a, a tumor in your pituitary and you produce too much um, growth hormone, then um, you could um, uh, get your jaw, your face kind of becomes disfigured and your fingers and toes will keep growing. Now this um, drug is also, or not this drug, but this hormone also influences glucose levels. in the body. So a person that takes a growth hormone might be at risk of becoming diabetic because this actually increases glucose. So we have an increase in glucose, which is the energy that is necessary for cells to become big and cells to divide. And then we also have an increase in what is called lipolysis. And so what do you think lipolysis means? What does lysis mean? Hydrolysis, lysis, water, breaking apart, right? And so this is when you break down fats to produce energy. So that would be fat metabolism. Okay, so that's lipolysis. Okay, um, so the interesting thing is, is that they do give growth hormone to cows. And so you can talk about um, bovine growth hormone. And so sometimes they will give these to cows to increase lactation. So to dairy cows. 
And then if they're raising spears and trying to get more muscle mass, then this also increases muscle mass. So sometimes you can see, you see uh, uh, that the growth hormone free milk, for example, or that this, this uh, beef, this um, meat was um, produced without hormones. And that is primarily what they're talking about. The thing about this hormone is, is that it is a protein. So really, when you take it into your mouth, you cannot just take it into your mouth and then expect it to have effects in your body because you're going to digest it. So you just digest it down into the amino acids. So you can't really take growth hormone and just eat it and then have it affect your body. So you could, talk, you could think about um, this as being maybe for animal health reasons or for some ecological reasons why you wouldn't want the... Uh, uh, meat or the milk that's produced like this, but this would actually not be absorbed directly. It would be broken down. Right? So it's not going to influence your levels of human growth hormone by taking bovine growth hormone. So in order to take to, to have an influence, you would have to inject growth hormone directly into your circulatory system. And that would go for the synthetic growth hormones that they actually use to treat um, hyper um, uh, or excuse me, hypo levels of growth hormone in the body. Okay. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is the thyroid gland. So the thyroid gland is separate from the pituitary gland, and it is located in your neck. So the thyroid gland is in the neck region, in front of the trachea. So if we look at a diagram from your book, right, this would be my um, diagram or my image of the thyroid. So it actually sits like right underneath the Adam's apple or your thyroid cartilage. This would be also your larynx or your voice box. So it sits right and it sits above the heart. <laughs> So the thyroid gland is really interesting because it is the one gland that needs a mineral in order to produce the hormone. So what mineral does the thyroid gland need? Hmm? Iodine, right? So iodine is needed for thyroid hormone production. So there's certain vegetables that have iodine in them, and it's also very um, common in seafood. You can get lots of iodine in seafood. But in order to, uh, to assure that we are getting enough iodine, what have we added to it in our diet? Salt. So we have iodinized salt. Now, sometimes um, we can get radioactive iodine in our environment. So for example, in Japan, when they had the meltdown of the nuclear power plant, they were worried about the radioactive iodine. So I'll just put in the aside here, is, is that radioactive iodine can accumulate in the thyroid. And it can lead to thyroid cancer. So even on the Pacific coast, they were talking about people buying iodine because one of the things that you can do is you can take a bunch of iodine before the radioactive iodine gets into your environment and store it up so that your, your thyroid gland would be less likely to, um, to um, absorb the radioactive iodine so you're less likely to get thyroid cancer. So when they talk about taking iodine supplements, uh, during a nuclear um, disaster, that is what they're referring to. Okay, so when we look at the thyroid gland um, in itself, it produces what is called thyroglobulin. So 
So globulin refers to the fact that this is a globular protein. Now, if this globular protein does not combine with iodine, then it builds up and you can get what is referred to as a goiter. So a swollen thyroid gland due to the lack of iodine So this is due to iodine deficiency. Causes a goiter. So this is a swelling of the thyroid gland, and it's a big swelling of the neck. That's a G, <laughs> not a Q, goiter. So if we look at an uh, image of this from your book, there's a child that is um, iodine deficient, and you can see that his thyroid gland is swelling up. So this might have really been common in countries where you don't have the necessary nutrients, um, you're not taking and eating the necessary um, uh, vegetables or animals that, have or that are high in iodine. So all you would have to do for this person is give them an iodine supplement and then that thyroglobulin would cease to be produced and it would be secreted um, in, as a thyroid hormone. So the two thyroid hormones are actually T3 and T4. So T3 is called triiodo um, thyroidine. Do I have that written down? Sorry. Triiodothyronine. Triiodothyronine. Okay, so I'd never make you write that out, right? But notice the tri there. So that's T3. So what that means is, is that this has three iodine mo molecules attached to the thyroid thyroglobulin. And this is what is produced out in the tissues. So it's produced by cells in the tissues. So out in the body, away from the thyroid gland. And then we have T4, and this is what is called thyroxine. And this is got four iodine molecules, and this is um, the main thyroid hormone. Okay. So if we were to look at a picture of this going on inside of the cells, it would look something like this. So this is um, just showing both the production of T3 and T4. So the protein is produced and it's secreted into a space um, that where the iodine is stored. So the iodine is stored here. The protein is secreted into that space and then the iodine binds to it. And so if there's four little blue circles here, then that's T4. If there's only um, three, then that is T3. And then these get passed back into the cells and secreted into the circulatory system. Okay. So the function of the thyroid hormone is, is that this boosts metabolism in almost all of your body cells. So metabolism is the production of proteins, but it's also the breaking apart. So it just speeds up the chemical reactions. <coughs> so it all boosts, maybe with this S there, boosts metabolism, increases the metabolism in all body cells. So we can talk about what it would be like to be hypothyroid. So you would have hypothyroidism. And so for example, if you all of a sudden gain 20 pounds or 40 pounds or whatever, you would probably go to the doctor and they would say, let's look at your thyroid um, levels. 
And so they would take a sample and they would run the thyroid levels. So if you have too little of, of the thyroxine or the triiodothyronine, this would cause weight gain. You would feel cold. So kind of cold and clammy, right? And you would not have a lot of energy, so low energy. On the other hand, you could have hyperthyroidism, which has exactly kind of the opposite effect. So you'd have weight loss. You would be hot, so you would in inability to tolerate heat because you'd already be so hot, right? And you tend to be irritable. So hypothyroidism could be due to not enough iodine in your, in your diet, but it could just be also due sometimes um, the hypothyroid, um, there's an example of Hashimoto's um, uh, sy syndrome that is an example of hypothyroidism where you're just really sluggish. And hyperthyroidism, on the other hand, most likely is due to what is called Graves' disease. So Graves' disease is an autoimmune disease. that produces antibodies that mimic TSH. So what does you, do you remember what TSH stands for? T thyroid, S would probably be stimulating, H hormone. So these are um, the antibodies that are produced actually bind to the pituitary gland and have caused the pituitary gland to produce too much thyroxine. And so this speeds up your metabolic rate. And one of the characteristics of this disease tends to be this bulging, these bulging eyes. So in this diagram, they're showing a person that has Graves' disease and their eyes kind of swell up, the tissue behind them swells, swells up and they get these bulging eyes. So one way that you can treat this um, is that you could actually give them radioactive iodine to kill some of the thyroxine producers, producing cells, or you could also um, actually take out the thyroid entirely and then a person is reliant upon drugs for the rest of their life. They have to take thyroxine and take it in and um, administer it to themselves so they're actually dependent upon it. So you could destroy the thyroid cells with radioactive iodine. You can remove the, the thyroid and treat with drugs. Okay. Yes? You can as long as you're given drugs for it, right? So that's why it's really bad to have your thyroid removed because you're dependent upon medications for the rest of your life to keep your metabolism at the right level. So sometimes when people, you know, have this radioactive iodine, then they have to be isolated or they have to sleep on the couch, not with their spouse when they have the radioactive iodine. This actually is really common in cats, Graves' diseases. And so um, they could they treat the cats the same way. They can either give them a their thyroid out, give them radioactive iodine, or um, generally it's in old cats, so they just give them drugs to kind of treat the effects of it. Hyper, hyper. So that means that there's too much thyroid hormone in the body. Yeah. Question. Or yep. Not really a question, but I'm just saying, uh, yep. I actually have a slide that you can that I was diagnosed with. It's not like. 
So do you have too much thyroid hormone? I maybe, <laughs> but I had it checked recently. Okay, so they just thought, oh, you. That's interesting. How did they detect that you had a large one? I, I can't remember, but maybe if you have a thick yeah, neck. Yeah, it's kind or, of like yeah, because my mom also had it too. Yeah. So can it be passed on like genetically? I don't know. I've never heard of a genetic, but predisposition for large <laughs> thyroid glands, but yeah. possibly. So one of the things about thyroid hormone is it's really important for the development of neurons. So in children, a lack of thyroid hormone causes a, sim a syndrome called cretinism. And this specifically affects the development of the nervous system. And so these people have um, developmental uh, disabilities, right? So this is in the nervous system, but also in the body wide. So lack of proper development body wide, but also neurological problems. Right, so lack of thyroid hor hormone, that would be hypothyroidism. Okay, so the thyroid gland also regulates blood calcium levels. And so when we talk about the blood calcium levels, this is um, the in the blood, and it is described as either being hyper or hypocalcemic. Uh, so we can talk about hypocalcemic. So this would be low blood calcium levels. And we learned about how important calcium is to the nervous system, but also to the muscular system. So when we look at the, um, the um, hypocalcemia, this causes nervousness, um, confusion, so I'll put confusion, numbness, so nervous system, and then also muscle spasms, and seizures. It can also lead to a heart attack and death. So cardiac arrest, cardiac <coughs> arrest, and death. So in order for you to absorb calcium, what vitamin do you need? What is added to milk? D. Okay, so vitamin D is needed to absorb calcium. Calcium from food. So you actually, when you're like drinking milk or whatever has calcium in it, some vegetables and food, other foods have milk or calcium in them. You actually have to have vitamin D present in order for that absorption to take place across the smooth uh, or the, the small intestine. And so that's why they add vitamin D to milk, is in order to make sure that you are able to absorb the calcium and you're not just drinking milk for, you know, the lactose, the sugars, and the proteins in it, but also the minerals. So the hypocalcemia is um, treated or are controlled by your body by what is called the parathyroid hormone. So this is PTH, and para means around, and it's around the thyroid. And this is just a small patches of glandular tissue that are embedded in the back of the thyroid gland. So small patches um, embedded in the posterior of the 
thyroid gland. So if it is present, it actually causes calcium to be removed from the bone and put into the circulation. So it causes the breakdown of the bone and the release of calcium into the blood. antagonistically, and this is called calcitonin. So this is produced by the thyroid gland. So it's not a thyroid, it's actually a thyroid hormone, but it's not one of those metabolic <coughs> hormones. So it's produced by the thyroid gland. And it acts antagonistically, so it decreases blood calcium levels. So it causes calcium to be deposited in the bone. Calcitonin is really important in other animals, but um, your textbook notes that it is not the main hormone for regulating blood calcium levels, but the higher thyroid hormone is. And it might actually serve another function as well. So we don't know, it doesn't seem to be really super important in humans, but um, it does, will act antagonistically. Maybe it's because we, being hypercalcemic is, is rarer than being hypocalcemic. So in your book, they show this homeostatic balance. This is the back. So notice that this is the back of this, this person's neck. Right? This is the back of the thyroid gland. And these little patches right here are your parathyroid hormone glands. Here are the parathyroid glands. And so this shows a diagram of how that parathyroid hormone works, specifically how it causes calcium to be released from the bone and then put back into circulation. Okay, so the last glands that we're going to talk about today are the adrenal glands. So where are the adrenal glands located? Above the kidneys. So located superior to the kidneys. The adrenal gland actually has two parts to it. So when we talk about the adrenal medulla, this is actually nervous tissue. It's actually believed to be a misplaced sympathetic ganglia. So we'll put misplaced sympathetic, so that's the autonomic nervous system, ganglia. So remember that the sympathetic ganglia are usually near the spinal cord. So this one is out far from the spinal cord and in at the adrenal medulla. So this releases epinephrine and norepinephrine, adrenaline. So that's why it's called the adrenal gland. The medulla is the inside. Okay, so I'll put inside. So when we're talking about the glandular part, it is the adrenal cortex. So this is the cortex is the outer part and it is glandular. So it is what produces the hormones. 
And um, these, um, uh, these glandular hormones are sometimes called corticohormones. Adrenocortico hormones. So anytime you see this cortico, that means that's referring to the cortex of the adrenal gland. And remember that we talked about this in terms of the pituitary gland because the pituitary gland produces a stimulating gland or hormone that stimulates the adrenal gland. Okay, so the first um, adrenal gland that, or hormone that I wanna talk about are what is referred to as the mineral corticoids. I forgot to mention that all of these are steroids. So they're all lipid based steroids. So the example of the mineral corticoid is aldosterone. And we'll talk about aldosterone in detail in 233 next fall, because aldosterone affects the kidneys. And so it increases the reuptake of sodium by the kidneys. So that's the idea of the mineral. So the mineral is sodium. So what this does is, is that this also increases when we take in sodium into our blood um, and from the uh, filtrate in the kidneys, this also increases the reuptake of water because water will just automatically follow sodium via osmosis, so it follows the salt. So water gets taken in. And what this does is this increases your blood volume and increases your blood pressure. So aldosterone influences as a hormone that influences your blood pressure. So if your blood pressure is too low, then aldosterone is released. If your blood pressure is not too low or if it's too high, then aldosterone is not released. And so that regulates and has its target on the kidneys. The next type of cortical hormone are the gonadocorticoids. Okay. And so this has to do with the production of estrogen and testosterone. So estrogen and testosterone. So your gonads, your ovary, is not the only thing that produces estrogen, and testes are not the only thing that produces that produce testosterone. So for example, um, females, um, if you are competitive, or if you're in like a highly competitive environment, or if you're an athlete, you might have higher testosterone levels than typical in females that do not have um, a competitive environment. And males also have estrogen in their body, and it's important in their um, functioning. And as they get older, their testosterone levels drop, and they have a, a higher level of estrogen. So they just they tend to be older men tend to be less competitive, and maybe they've been a little bit more lovey or a little bit more tender, more feminine than younger males. And so these gonadocorticoids are important. Right. Is that why men sometimes end up gaining more weight as they get older because testosterone levels drop? It could be too. Yeah, men lose, and we all lose plus muscle mass. So as you age, you tend to your muscles tend to shrink up, and you, you lose muscle mass. And yeah, so maybe estrogen um, influences weight gain as well in males. And then the last one we're going to talk about is the glucocorticoids. Oops, coids. That's 
spelled the same way up here, sorry, glucocorticoids. So gluco refers to what? Sugar, okay? So these are, um, these are actually the stress hormones and they include cortisol and cortisone. So these are stimulated under periods of stress like the fight or flight. Your cortisone levels are gonna go up. Your cortisone levels are, and your cortisol levels are higher in the morning. So this is kind of what gets you up out of bed, right? So the cortisol level makes you people that get up out of bed really fast, you know, and are just jump out and can do anything. They generally have high cortisol levels. Okay. And it's not like the same thing with like cortisone cream. Yes. And so it is also um, anti-inflammatory. So it's anti-inflammation. But it increases glucose levels in the body. Right? And the breakdown of fats. So it also increases the, the glucose. And so if you have like a pituitary uh, um, tumor that causes too much glucocorticoids, you can actually get what is referred to as um, pituitary diabetes. So I'm running out of room here, so I'm going to write this up here. So pituitary diabetes is due to a uh, tumor in the pituitary gland and overstimulation and overproduction. of adrenal hormones, specifically the glucocorticoids. So with diabetes, when you have high glucose levels, what some of the things that happen is sometimes you gain weight. You also tend to retain water. So if you have high um, uh, levels of this, you tend to um, gain water uh, weight and then also gain some fat. And so in your book, they have a picture of kind of trying to, okay. So this is a person that has too much glucocorticoids and that is referred to as Cushing's disease. So that's too much glucocorticoids. And so one of the things that happens is, is that um, you can see here that our face has changed shape. It could be due to water retention. And then they also get this what they call a buffalo hump in the back. So this is not bone. This would be deposition of fat. Okay? So this is before and after. So she could have had a tumor that caused Cushing's syndrome. And she probably also has problems with regulating her blood glucose levels because of the excess glucocorticoids in her body. Okay, so if we um, talk about these stress hormones, one of the um, drugs that is commonly prescribed to decrease inflammation is called prednisone. Has anybody ever been on prednisone? Prednisone is used to treat autoimmune diseases. You also sometimes have to go on it if you have a transplant of a tissue or an organ because this suppresses the immune system. And it decreases inflammation. So reasons why you might be on it is if you have an allergic reaction. Like, for example, I got um, a poison ivy really bad, and it spread all over my legs. And so they gave me prednisone. And then that caused um, 
the inflammation to go down and then it healed itself up over time. So this is um, oral. Sometimes it can be used, it can be injected. Prednisone can also be injected. But it is a steroid and so it does affect your whole metabolism. So like when you're on prednisone, you're actually on steroids and so you just feel like you could do anything. Like it's like, it's like your metabolism just goes wow, right? And you have a lot of energy. Um, but staying on it for long periods of time can be really bad over time because it could lead to um, diabetes and, and problems in regulating your glucose levels. And it does cause swelling. One other uh, thing that I take prednisone for is sometimes I get really bad sciatic pain, which is due to a herniation in my back. And so oral prednisone will help um, decrease those symptoms as well. So you can, give, you can take it for herniations. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna watch a video that talks about these stress hormones, the glucocorticoids, and it's just a little animation. So it talks about how um, stress, chronic stress affects your body. Framing for a test, <laughs> trying to get more done than you have time to do. Stress is a feeling we all experience when we are challenged or overwhelmed. But more than just an emotion, stress is a hardwired physical response that travels throughout your entire life. In the short term, stress can be advantageous, but when activated too often or too long, your primitive fight or flight stress response not only changes your brain, but also damages many of the other organs and cells throughout your body. Your adrenal gland releases the stress hormones cortisol, epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, and norepinephrine. As these hormones travel through your bloodstream, they easily reach your blood vessels and heart. Adrenaline causes your heart to beat faster and raises your blood pressure, over time causing hypertension. Cortisol can also cause the endothelium or inner lining of blood vessels to not function normally. Scientists now know that this is an early step in triggering the process of atherosclerosis or cholesterol plaque buildup in your arteries. Together, these changes increase your chances of a heart attack or stroke. When your brain senses stress, it activates your autonomic nervous system. Through this network of nerve connections, your big brain communicates stress to your enteric or intestinal nervous system. Besides causing butterflies in your stomach, this brain-gut connection can disturb the natural rhythmic contractions that move food through your gut leading to irritable bowel syndrome, and can increase your gut sensitivity to acid, making you more likely to feel heartburn. Via the gut's nervous system, stress can also change the composition and function of your gut bacteria, which may affect your digestive and overall health. Speaking of digestion, does chronic stress affect your waistline? Well, yes. Cortisol can increase your appetite, it tells your body to replenish your energy stores with energy-dense foods and carbs, causing you to crave comfort foods. High levels of cortisol can also cause you to put on those extra calories as a visceral or deep belly fat. This type of fat doesn't just make it harder to button your pants. It is an organ that actively releases hormones and immune system chemicals called cytokines that can increase your risk of developing chronic diseases such as heart disease and insulin resistance. Meanwhile, stress hormones affect immune cells in a variety of ways. Initially, they help prepare to fight invaders and heal after injury, but chronic stress can dampen the function of some immune cells, making you more susceptible to infections and slow the rate you heal. Want to live a long life? You may have to curb your chronic stress. 
That's because it has even been associated with shortened telomeres, the shoelace tip ends of chromosomes that measure a cell's age. Telomeres cap chromosomes to allow DNA to get copied every time a cell divides without damaging the cell's genetic code, and they shorten with each cell division. When telomeres become too short, a cell can no longer divide, and it dies. As if all that weren't enough, chronic stress has even more ways it can sabotage your health, including acne, hair loss, sexual dysfunction, headaches, muscle tension, difficulty concentrating, fatigue, and irritability. So, what does all this mean for you? Your life will always be filled with stressful situations, but what matters to your brain and entire body is how you respond to that stress. If you can view those situations as challenges you can control and master, rather than as threats that are insurmountable, you will perform better in the short run and stay healthy in the long run. Okay, any questions about that? Nope. Okay, so let's just take a look at the review sheet. Anybody have a copy that I can just glance at for a second? Okay, so we did talk a little bit about the endocrine disrupting chemicals. What was the example that I gave you in class? Very last thing. Anybody remember? It leaches out of plastic. BPA. Okay. So there's other types of those. Um, so some pesticides. Um, like and herbicides like pathazine is a really common one that is also mimics. Um, um, so there's other ones besides that. But so when we're talking about those endocrine disrupting hormones, we talked about a synthetic chemical that mimics estrogen, and that was EPA. You can um, cross off the function of the pancreas. We'll talk about that next quarter. Next quarter, we'll talk about that in 233 when we talk about. Um, the digestive system, because the pancreas is a major digestive plant as well. So what is the difference between an endocrine and an exocrine gland? Does one secrete like yeah. So what's an example of an exocrine gland? Yeah, so sweat glands or salivary glands are exocrine. Mammary glands are also exocrine. The endocrine gland is um, that which produces hormones and it secretes it into the circulatory system versus secreting it via a duct. We did really talk about motion sickness, so you could scratch that off with the last thing we talked about. Motion sickness is oftentimes when your what you're seeing does not match what you're feeling in your body. So for example, when you're in a car, you might not feel like you're moving if you're at the same um, speed, but you see things moving, or you actually might not feel like you're moving, but you're reading a book and you're bouncing around. And so um, when there's a mismatch between what you see and what you're, and what you're feeling, then that can sometimes lead to motion sickness. So you can cross that one off. What is the blind spot? Right, so that's where there are no photoreceptors. Okay, I think that's it. So everything else should be okay on there. Are there any specific questions about the review or the essay questions? Okay, so number four. Okay, so the polarization and subsequent contraction of the skeletal muscle cell. Okay, so remember that what is um, the um, neurotransmitter that's released 
um, and stimulates, what is the neurotransmitter called that is released and stimulates motor neuron, or skeletal muscle, excuse me, skeletal muscles. Acetylcholine, excellent. Okay, so this is number four. Okay, so this would be motor neurons release acetylcholine. This binds to receptors on the skeletal muscle. Okay. This causes depolarization. And what kind of ion channels do you think it opens? Sodium, right? So it opens sodium ion channels. So the depolarization causes calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a special organelle which is found in the skeletal muscle cells and other muscle cells. And it functions to store calcium. Calcium binds with, does it bind with troponin or tropomyosin? Troponin. So it binds to troponin. Troponin is the smaller molecule this causes tropomyosin to move. So it changes shape. So it causes tropomyosin to move and expose binding sites for the myosin heads. So the next thing that happens is the myosin heads have to be energized by ATP. They bind to the actin, and then you have the filaments sliding together, and the sarcomere shortens. So the myosin binds, pivots, and the sarcomere shortens. If a bunch of sarcomeres shorten, right, all in a row, this is going to ultimately lead to the whole muscle contraction, right? So it leads to muscle contraction. I think that pretty much answers that question. Any other ones? Um, how many questions will be on the lab? Two or three. <laughs> okay. So I will see you on Friday at 11 for your lab practical on the muscles, the eye, and the ear. Don't forget that those uh, models are in the library if you want to review them. They were not going to be graded, but they could be on the lab practical. You are going to turn in your lab notebook when you uh, turn in your final, or when you come for the final exam. So you'll turn in, you'll have your lab notebook to study for the final exam on Monday. It was.